any questions? So we're getting started. Um, before we get into some of those things, uh, some of the review, um, I realized I had some other samples of things. Uh, remember we talked about cold welding and we talked about the fact that aluminum will cold bond better than virtually anything other than indium. Uh, and then we talked about uh, electronic materials. But in fact, uh, aluminum is used in lots of other applications uh, other than wire bonding. It's not used very much in wire bonding. Um, a couple of their applications here. This is a thrust bearing that goes in some part of a transmission in a car. And essentially, it's a uh, piece of steel with an aluminum alloy, um, relatively pure aluminum. It's a 3000 series aluminum alloy. Actually, um, sometimes it's a 3000 series aluminum alloy, which is similar to beer can stock. Okay, uh, Coke cans and beer cans are made out of a, like a 99% aluminum, 1% manganese alloy uh, because you, you want it to form well to make the, the, the cans. So it's mostly pure aluminum with a little bit of strengthening agent. This is either, this one is either uh, that type of um, uh, aluminum manganese alloy, or it may be an aluminum tin alloy. And what they do is they take the sheet and they nickel plate it, or first they roughen it up, they sand it um, to get more potential bonded area, and then they give it a little little bit of a nickel plate, and then they. Uh, they sand the aluminum that's going to be bonded to it, and they just put the two through a big roller. And in this case, there's not much sideways extrusion. There's some, but mostly it's just a straight downward force. And you can't do that with most materials. If you try to do that with copper, uh, it wouldn't work at all. Uh, with, but aluminum, fairly pure aluminum, can bond with only 40% total deformation. Uh, and, and it's not a that particular bond is not a perfect bond. Uh, same type of thing, I passed around that Farberware pot. Um, that has an aluminum bo uh, bottom to it. And they do a similar type of thing. They uh, sand the bottom of the stainless steel, they sand the aluminum, they put the thing in a great big press and they go swam, okay? And they, they get some, actually a coining operation. Coining operation is where you take, it's the way you emboss uh, coins in your pocket. Uh, there's not a lot of change of shape, but you are actually embossing the surface and getting some flow on a, on a small scale. So there is some sideways movement. It's just not, it's not big movement like you have in a, in a friction weld where you extrude things out of the joint. So they actually coin the aluminum to the bottom of the fiberware pot. And we won't talk about it, well, actually maybe we'll talk about it a little bit later today, but I ended up visiting the plant and realizing that you actually don't want 100% bonded area on the bottom of that pot. You've got aluminum and stainless steel, and if the two of them um, were perfectly bonded, when you heat it up, you put it on the stove top, the aluminum is going to expand more than stainless steel, and the bottom of your pot is going to turn, it's going to be bowl shaped, and the pot's going to rock on the on the uh, on the uh, on the cooking surface. And so, in fact, they only want something like a 20 to 30 percent or 40 percent bonded area. I mean, with that much bonded area, that bottom's not going to come off. Uh, you actually want some some spaces in between so that the material can expand and contract uh, on a small scale rather than bow on a large scale. Um, this is actually this. If you look on the outside; it's a John Deere bearing from one of their engines, diesel engines. And this has got an aluminum tin alloy that's bonded the same way as that other thrust bearing, but then the whole thing's machined and and all kinds of other stuff to it. But um, basically, it's cold welded after they roughen up the surface and put a little nickel plate on. Uh, the nickel plate just gives a better, more uniform bonded area surface than the uh, steel. It's not as easily contaminated with uh, carbon and other things. Um, let's see, do I have any, oh, one other thing on, another form of cold welding we haven't talked about is explosive welding. And this was discovered during World War II when people were firing at things and if the shells hit two pieces of metal just right and the two pieces of metal were at the proper angle and the explosion pushed one into the other, this might be a 15 to 30 degree angle, you actually would get a weld between the two materials. And this is all cold because it's in, during the time of the explosion, so there's no time to heat up the, the pieces of material. It's just the force of the explosion deforms one plate against the other plate. And there are whole books written on this subject. 
I've tabbed three pages. One shows the way you would bond a plate to another plate. Um, another one shows the different types of materials. And the last one shows the interface. And what happens in explosive bonding, <coughs> if you have a, a plate like this and another plate at some angle to it, you put some explosive charge on the outside of this plate, and the explosive doesn't go off. Uh, it goes off in a split second, but it, it actually propagates just like a flame, just pro propagating very fast. So what they would do is they would ignite it at this end, and the plate would slowly be pressed down such that at a later time, this would be flattened, and this would be still ready to come down. And the interface, you actually blow out some of the oxides and things, and you end up with a wavy interface, which is one of the third picture in that book that I tabbed, shows this type of wavy interface that you get. And so you can make, you can clad one plate to another very efficiently. It's just it sort of makes a lot of noise. And so there's, uh, there used to be two companies that did explosive bonding in this country. One was DuPont. And DuPont um, actually started and made all their money during the Revolutionary War making explosives. And a lot of the explosives manufacture in this country is all centered in Delaware and Pennsylvania because of DuPont. Uh, another interesting thing about explosives manufacture, if you go back and look over the last 200 years, the average time between blowing up a building and an explosives plant is four years. Okay, They have a major problem every four years, and it hasn't changed for 200 years. Um, uh, so if you go visit an explosives facility, they tend to have, you know, the manufacturing facility is up on a hill away from everything else or something and tends to only have one or two people placed in it. And now it's more and more robots and things like that. But, but if you plot things over the last 200 years, it's every four years they blow up a building. And sometimes, unfortunately, kill some people doing it. But fewer and fewer people are dying nowadays uh, because they've got more robots in there. In any case, um, DuPont used to use a valley out in the, the wilds of some coal mining area of, of uh, Pennsylvania to do their explosive stuff. I'm not sure DuPont's still in the business, but there is a firm out in Colorado called Explosive Fabricators, and that's all they do. They've got this little canyon in the Rocky Mountains away from everybody else, and they just, you know, every couple of days they blow up the plate. Um, now, why do you want to clad plates? Anybody have an idea why you care about cladding plates? And the super, uh, joining the superstructure. Yep, that's one. That's definitely one. Uh, it's kind of a specialized one for the Navy, where the Navy used to like to have lightweight superstructures um, because the, the ships tend to get top heavy. In fact, an aircraft carrier gains 250 tons a year in weight. That's not too bad because it weighs 70,000 tons to begin with. But even so, over the last 30 years, at 250 tons a year, it's gained uh, 7,500 uh, or no. 30 years, yeah, 7,500 tons. Uh, so it's gained 10% in weight over the last uh, um, the last 30 years. And so, you know, if ships get too heavy, they tend to tend to capsize and tip over. Um, so the Navy used to build aluminum superstructures, and they still got plenty of ships out there with aluminum superstructures. Um, but you have to join the aluminum superstructure to the steel superstructure, and you can't join aluminum to, to iron. Uh, by any simple process, and so they would actually explosively bond plates uh, and make a, a big steel plate, and a, an aluminum plate, explosion weld them together, and then you would weld by arc welding or whatever else, steel to steel and aluminum to aluminum using this transition joint. Um, now, does anybody know why the Navy in the mid-80s got out of aluminum superstructures and started to design ships with basically a steel waffle mem membrane type of construction? Oh, yep. Why? That's right. It's called the Bell. That's one of the reasons. There's two, actually two reasons. That was the Belknap disaster. The destroyer was named the Belknap, and they were having exercises. And uh, uh, the Belknap, uh, well, they had a, 
I guess it was near one of the elevators or something on the aircraft carrier. Anyway, the Belknap and the aircraft carrier um, collided or, or something. Um, I don't know the exact story. Someone certainly lost his career. His career was over at that point. Uh, but what happened is um, some jet fuel leaked down on top of the superstructure of the Belknap and it caught on fire. And the problem, remember the thermite reaction where you have uh, Fe, I'll just call it Fe203 uh, plus aluminum goes to Al203 plus iron plus heat. Well, there's plenty of rust on ships. So that plus the jet fuel, they actually started an aluminum fire. Aluminum will burn just like magnesium will burn. That's what a sparkler is on the 4th of July. It's finely divided powder. But in fact, if you get hot enough, if your fire gets hot enough to melt the aluminum oxide, you will keep on exposing fresh aluminum to air, and you can ignite aluminum metal, and you have a huge flare, a very large flare. And at the, the time, the joke in the fleet was a gallon of jet fuel would wipe out any ship in the fleet. Well, there was a reason they were saying that, because about the same time, the British had the Falkland Islands War uh, with Argentina. If you remember, probably don't remember. This is getting old enough. Most of you are still in diapers, but anyway. Um, the, uh, the British cruiser Sheffield, I mean, cruisers, one of the, except for the couple of aircraft carriers the British have, uh, a cruiser is the largest ship they have. They don't have battleships anymore. We don't have any active anymore. But in any case, so this is one of the largest ships they have. And uh, a French Exocet missile, which had been purchased by the Argentinians, hit the Sheffield, and the whole Sheffield was destroyed. And people think it was the Exocet that destroyed the Sheffield. Well, a little old, you know, Exocet is not going to wipe out a ship that's five, six hundred feet long. Okay, uh, I don't know if it's five, probably four or five hundred feet long. It might do some serious damage, but it's not going to wipe it out. What happened is the Exocet started a thermite reaction, just like the jet fuel did on the Belknap, and it was the burning of the superstructure. So now I have tons and tons of fuel, basically the aluminum burning in the air, and you can't put out a metal fire. Uh, not easily, and certainly not one of that size you know, going that rapidly. So they lost the whole cruiser because the missile essentially ignited the superstructure. So they decided they shouldn't build your superstructures out of fuel, okay, basically aluminum. And so they've, they've changed the design of those ships. Uh, so explosive fabrication is used, as you said, to make the transition joints for ships, but more importantly in the chemical process industry, uh, and in the utilities industry where you're burning coal or other things in a steam plant, there's some places where you need a lot of corrosion resistance and you'd like to use, let's say, a stainless steel and you want to build a pressure vessel, except a four inch th thick pressure vessel out of stainless steel is going to be really pricey. And so you may only need a half an inch of stainless steel for corrosion resistance, and you may, but you need four inches of steel for the strength of this great big vessel. So what do you do? You explosively bond three quarters of an inch of stainless steel on top of a three or four inch uh, carbon steel plate, and then you weld those together. Um, and you have to be careful how you weld them so you don't contaminate the stainless steel with the carbon steel, but people know how to do that. Uh, you weld from one side on the carbon steel, and then you weld from the other side with the stainless steel, and you may put in a nickel alloy in between uh, to keep the stainless and the nickel from, or the stainless and the iron from um, degrading one another. Uh, it's not always stainless steel. Uh, sometimes you want to use tantalum. Tantalum is one of the most corrosion resistant materials that we have. Um, the problem with tantalum is it melts at around 3,000 degrees centigrade. It's kind of second to tungsten in terms of the melting point of metals. And it also has a price similar to silver. So with this excellent corrosion resistance, you may only need a tenth of an inch of tantalum, but your pressure vessel may be two inches thick. Well, you obviously can't build a two inch thick silver pre or tantalum pressure vessel. Uh, it'd be too expensive. So you ex explosively bond tantalum to a steel surface, and then you weld the two together, uh, so far as that goes. Um, uh, so there's all kinds of different combinations of materials that you, you bond together. In fact, there's a, people don't realize it, one of the larger companies in Massachusetts 
is down in Attleboro, and it's not one of the gold companies, it's the Metals and Controls Division of Texas Instruments. Um, Texas Instruments, we all know as you know, making semiconductors. But tech, that's not what they started out as. Cecil Green, who's an MIT graduate, and if you go over in that building and walk down the first floor, uh, first floor hallway, you'll see this nice wooden walkway or kind of doorway in the middle of the hall, and it says the Green Center of Physics. That's because Cecil Green, a graduate of the MIT class of 1923, gave six or eight million dollars to the physics department to build a new building. That's about 20 years ago and the physics department has never raised the rest of the money to build the building. Um, but there's another building on campus called the Green Building. Anyone know what that is? Tallest building on campus. What's the tallest building on campus? It's the geology building. It's right next to the chemistry building. If you go out here past the physics building right there, they're rebuilding the chemistry building, big tall building right in front of kind of Walker Memorial. That's the Cecil and I, the Green Building. And Cecil graduated class of 23 from MIT in geology. And he went down to Texas to the oil fields and he purchased a little company that was making um, uh, little bimetallic strips for, uh, for little instruments that are used to measure pressure and other things in the oil fields. And the company's name was Texas Instruments. And um, later, in the 1950s, Texas Instruments started getting involved in the silicon technology, and it sort of got bigger and bigger. But metals and controls, uh, somewhere, I don't remember, in the 30s or 40s, um, Texas Instruments purchased the metals and controls division in Attleboro, Massachusetts. Attleboro is the gold capital of the world, and that's where people had been bonding gold sheet to copper or brass uh, base materials and making things like this, these happen to be titanium, but uh, years, several years ago, I had some gold-filled um, wire uh, eyeglass frames, or I had a pen that was gold-filled gold material. It's too expensive. To, well, you can't afford something out, out of solid gold um, for a pen or a pair of eyeglasses. So they would basically clad the surface with about 5% of the thickness, actually not 5% of the thickness, more like 2% of the thickness, would be a carat gold alloy, and the rest would be a base metal like brass. And so Attleboro had this bonding technology of cold bonding, just like the stuff that made that aluminum steel bearing that we talked about. The home of that, actually the home of it was Sheffield, England, but the big growth was Attleboro, Massachusetts, where people were making jewelry. Um, and Attleboro used to be called the jewelry capital of the world. Um, and they go through more jewelry gold in Attleboro than any other uh, place in the country. Um, in any case, Metals and Controls at one time was about a billion dollar a year operation down in Attleboro, making just cladding different types of metals, cold welding them together, typically for going into things, well, we don't have, well, over there, we've got a, a thermostat on the wall. The thermostat has a bimetallic strip in it. As it heats up, because of thermal expansion, the strip will curl as it heats up more and more, or as it cools down, it'll flatten out. And that movement of the strip makes an electrical contact that tells the thermostat when to turn on. Very, very accurate. Lots of instruments that are based on these bonded bimetallic strips, which are cold welded. Um, just to pass around another thing, pass around toys. This is a power gauge for surface roughness Although we have some $20,000 instruments now that essentially take a, a phonograph needle and run over the surface, if you work in a machine shop, you buy one of these things and it tells you you're supposed to turn something to a particular surface finish roughness, which is given on the side, and the guy just carries that in his pocket. As he's machining something, he looks, he compares, that's a compar comparative gauge, he looks and says, does my surface look as smooth as that, this surface? And that's how he gauges the surface roughness. If you want to know something more precisely, you take it to this little phonograph needle type of machine, and you actually get a nice, uh, a nice printout of exactly what the surface roughness is. So having killed uh, half the class, talking about some more cold welding stuff, um, let's go back to the adhesive bonding. We talked about the Stefan equation and how it explains the effect of joint thickness and adhesive viscosity 
on the overall joint strength. And then we talked about how viscosity can be increased by orders of magnitude, about 10 or 15 orders of magnitude, by solvent removal, chemical reaction, or solidification. And that changes the time at which the joint will um, viscously flow apart or flow together, but flow apart is what we're interested in, by 10 to 15 orders of magnitude. And that's, that's a big difference. And essentially, we don't really think of adhesive joints as failing by adhesive or viscous flow, except sometimes we know that they only last five or 10 years. And in 10 years, that's 10 to the ninth seconds. So if I only got um, uh, a factor of 10 to the 10th, I might actually start to fail by, uh, by viscous flow um, in that 10 years. And I also mentioned, I was starting to talk about dis different types, types of adhesives, and I said they vary widely in cost and durability. From five or 10 cents a pound for things like starch. I mean, they use old corn stalks to get starch to make adhesives. A lot of waste products. We talked about fish glue, uh, old, old fish skins, uh, or blood, or the horse's hooves, um, or milk products. Turns out a lot of starches and a lot of proteins have fairly low surface energies, and so they will coat a surface. Um, you know, blood, I got a bloody nose last night. It was, you know, I was, I was, you know, doing it, it was sticking all over my, you know, blood was sticking all over my fingers. It'll, blood and uh, uh, other organic materials have, uh, are actually designed in many ways by nature to stick to things. And that's because of their low surface energy. Um, the fancier things like the cyanoacrylates, the crazy glue, crazy glue probably is worth something on the order of 10 to 20 or 30 dollars a pound depending on the particular type of crazy glue. When you buy it in the store, you're buying like a quarter ounce, okay, but you're paying two or three bucks. And that's inflated price, but even so, crazy glue is a synthetic polymer. It's not that easy to make. And so therefore, it's probably 10, 20, 30 dollars a pound. And I mentioned that some of the aircraft adhesives, or actually I mentioned the, the automotive adhesives nowadays are 10 to 12 dollars a pound typically. They used to be the cheap stuff in the 80s, but there were lots of failures. So if you got a 1980s car and it's got lots of rattles in it, it's, unfortunately for you, it's out of warranty. But you probably because your adhesive joints have fallen apart. So if you want to go get some rivets and have this really uh, have a car that looks like blue jeans or something, you can rivet your car back together. Um, in any case, um, then the the aircraft blues, where you've got an aircraft that's got to last 30, 40 years, those are very, very expensive, in some cases costing up to $400 a pound. And that's mostly because of moisture resistance and complex uh, formulations that uh, um, have been designed typically to work with a very, very specific type of material. Uh, I didn't bring it in, but I passed around before this little piece I have of the X-33 space plane, the little honeycomb structure, that was adhesively bonded. Um, they didn't have an adhesive to bond that together, um, that particular Nomex sheet, which is kind of like Kevlar honeycomb, uh, to the graphite epoxy outer skin. So they used a product made by 3M that um, comes in sheets of adhesive, so you'd, you'd have your your, uh, uh, your Nomex um, honeycomb, and you would take out of the refrigerator, because this stuff has to be stored in a refrigerator. It's both an epoxy type of thing that's chemical reaction, but it also had a little bit of solvent. It's a little bit of kind of both. And in order to, to uh, use it, even if stored in a refrigerator at 32 degrees Fahrenheit or 34 degrees Fahrenheit, it had only had a six month shelf life. And um, it actually was designed for aluminum to aluminum joints for aircraft. But it turns out NASA gave this contract of $1.3 billion. And the, part of the contract is from award of contract to first flight was supposed to be 33 months. You had to design, build, and fly this whole spacecraft. 
Now it didn't have to go into orbit. This this first one was only a, something that was going to go from um, uh, Edwards Air Force Base to Dugway Proving Grounds in Utah, and it was going to go up to about 100,000 feet and come down. And so it, it only had to last for 45 minutes in flight, and it was never. Uh, well, actually, it had to go 45 minute flight. I think I had to do 10 flights, so you had seven and a half hours of, of total flight time um, as they do their research. Well. The, uh, if you look at the, the literature, it said it had, once you take it out of the refrigerator and lay this down and everything, you had a 10-day um, a shelf life before you could put it into the um, autoclave. Autoclave is just a great big furnace. In this case, the uh, size of a small house, because that's the size of the tank they're building. In fact, the size of the tank they were building was limited by the fact that they were using the world's largest autoclave, which happened to be located in uh, uh, in Sunnyvale, California, at a Lockheed facility. Um, so they had this great big furnace, and they they uh, I'm pretty sure it's Sunnyvale anyway. Um, they had to lay everything up, fixture it together, and get it into the uh, get it into the furnace to cure this adhesive within, they thought, 10 days. And they actually did everything within four to eight days in most cases. Except they were on this fast time frame. They didn't have time to check this metal metal adhesive, which they were using for polymer to polymer. And um, it turns out that the really effective shelf life before the viscosity started to increase was about two days. Um, it was very good and very pliable, and you could get a, a good bond as everything flowed together within about two days. But after three and four days, and certainly after five or six, this stuff just didn't flow very well. And so after the fact, they learned they only had about one quarter of the strength that they hoped they had had. And they decided, well, uh, uh, as you usually do when you just built something for $50 million and You've, I'm sure you've all done this before. You just built something for $50 million and you find that you made a mistake. You go, oops. And so you go back and you sharpen your pencil and you say, oh, it'll be good enough. Okay? I had enough safety factor that I still, instead of having a factor of 300 safety factor, I now have a factor of 5% safety factor and that's good enough. Okay? So they tested it and it turns out it wasn't good enough. And so they canceled the rest of the $1.3 billion program. Um, so that's the problem with one of the problems with fast track projects. If you looked at that whole project, there was nothing that anyone did wrong at any point. It's just the whole thing. The train was moving faster than everybody could dot the I's and cross the T's. And sometimes those I's and T's come back to get you, which it did in that case. Um, so now we have space shuttles. We have four space shuttles out of five. Uh, they're all 25 years old, and NASA projects that we're going to lose one more space shuttle in the next 20, 25 years. They also project it takes about 20 to 25 years to develop a new space shuttle. Okay, so we can expect we can expect, or NASA expects. They don't put this on their website, but they expect another space shuttle failure sometime in the next 20, 25 years. Uh, and then they'll have space, three space shuttles, and then there'll be a real problem of getting things into space. Um, they can always do it with rockets, but it costs about twice as much. Um, however, NASA has started reopening, and the military have started opening some old rocket plants that have been in mothballs because they pretty much decided that they're not going to have a new space shuttle in time to replace the old one as it wears out. Um, so there's going to be some period 15 years from now where uh, it's going to get very pricey to go into space. Uh, not because we can't do it. Or actually, the, the solution is the Soviets will sell you uh, some cheap rides, right? Um, as far as that goes. Another thing to worry about in adhesives is because adhesives don't really remove the surface contamination, they just bury it, and their inherent strength is fairly low. Their actual strength may only be 100 pounds per square inch in many cases, whereas solder joints can be 10 times that, and braze joints. Uh, uh, 50 times that, and welds can be 100 times that. Um, adhesive joints are inherently weaker because you leave the contamination there, and you really got Van der Waals type of bonding going on. 
That means that you need lots of surface area in order to make good adhesive joints. If you need lots of surface area, you end up bonding things like powders, fibers, and sheets. Now, if I have two big plates, thick plates put together, I can't get anywhere near enough strength at that interface. There's just not enough area on two heavy sheets to equal the strength of the big heavy sheet itself. However, if I'm bonding thin fibers or powders, and we talked about it, it asphalt as an adhesive, you mix it with a bunch of rock or a crushed stone or, or whatever, and you pave roads with it. Of course, a lot of people have decided that paving highways is a great way to get rid of other um, uh, things like uh, you take some sort of um, glass that we, the, the old flux from steel making, and people say, ah, oh, that's uh, hazardous waste. We're building landfills and just sticking stuff in landfills of this old calcium silicate slag. Uh, why don't we use that and crush it up into uh, um, stone and mix it in with the asphalt, and now we can pave the highways with this, this stuff rather than crushing up rock. That's fine, except we produce in this country about 50 million tons a year of this slag when we're making 100 million tons of steel. And so it turns out we just don't pave that much road. Uh, and everybody else, uh, people have proposed taking old milk bottles. What do you do with old milk bottles? Um, people have proposed, well, we'll crush it up, and we'll find some way to mix it in with the... Uh, with the asphalt and we'll have this rubbery type of asphalt that'll have better, better life and everything else, except we drink too much milk, okay? We don't need, I mean, everybody wants to throw the, their waste into the asphalt and we just don't need that much stuff. Plus some of it, you have to change the whole chemistry of the asphalt to make it work. And then people say, well, let's throw the junk into concrete. Um, and we actually do use a lot of concrete, but it turns out a lot of these things really screw up the chemistry of the concrete. Um, concrete is, you're using it for structural applications, and if you start throwing some trash in there, you end up getting real junk. Uh, a number of years ago, um, some, uh, well, we'll call him a rocket scientist, but he, was, he was an MIT grad, was working for US Steel, and he decided, oh, we'll use the steel bath itself at 1600 degrees centigrade, molten steel, and we'll throw the junk in there and burn up our trash that way. And he went to uh, US Steel and says, I have this wonderful idea. We got 300 tons of molten steel. We'll just throw another 20, 30 tons of garbage in there and uh, um, we'll be able to, uh, it'll burn off everything. Well, that's true. It will burn off everything. So if you take uh, polyvinyl chloride, which is, contains chlorine, right, plastic, you can put it in there. The problem is in a steel furnace, you've got carbon and oxygen and if you add chlorine to that steel furnace, you form this gas. Anybody know what the name of that is? Phosgene. <clears throat> Phosgene was one of the weapons of mass destruction in World War I. Okay? So now you can have this pouring out by the ton out of your steel furnace. Uh, what a wonderful idea. So U.S. steel scientists looked at it and says, that's a dumb idea. And the guy says, can I have the patent rights? And sure enough, they said, sure, you can have the patent rights. We think it's a dumb idea. Uh, so he takes the patent rights. He comes back to chemical engineering at MIT, uh, enters as a graduate student, and sells the MIT technology licensing officer, the head of the program, on this wonderful technology called molten metals technology. And they go out for an IPO. All of a sudden, each one of them's worth 30, 40, 50 million dollars, and some of the rest of us are sitting here saying, we agree with U.S. Steel. We know something about steel making. We know something about thermochemistry. We know it's a dumb idea. But no, MIT got on the bandwagon. Fortunately, before they all got indicted about five years later, uh, MIT's name was not associated with it. Uh, but that was what some of us were really scared about because the, because the guy didn't have much money, so he actually patented it through MIT. But fortunately, all the venture capitalists came in and soaked people um, uh, and got out quick, and it was only the poor little people stupid enough to invest in it. Um, not stupid enough, I mean, they thought it was a great idea. The, their broker said, oh, this is wonderful, it's gonna clear up the, the universe. And in fact, I can't believe it, but the Department of Energy was looking at throwing radioactive waste in here, okay? Now, who thinks that putting radioactive waste 
into a furnace at 1600 degrees centigrade is, t is going to take away the radioactivity. Okay? You're just going to freeze it in and have radioactive steel. And in fact, if you want radioactive steel, you can buy it from the Ukraine right now. After Chernobyl, the uh, Soviets or the, the Ukrainians started, made some steel with some of the scrap that they had taken out of the Chernobyl plant, which had become radioactive. And they've been trying to peddle that on the uh, international market. And so it's been a problem in the shipbuilding industry lately. Uh, there's radioactive steel out there. And you know, they don't bother to tell anybody. You've got to take a Geiger counter to your imported steel now to see if you've got, you know, some things that are going to last there for 10,000 years and just going to glow at you, right? Um, but somehow, the U.S. Department of Energy, and that's why everybody ended up getting indicted in the end, um, uh, they had these big Department of Energy contracts to, uh, they were going to clean up the world, even radioactivity. Now, why, anyone thought, they could clean up radioactivity by throwing it in a molten bath? I mean, it's, it's sort of something, I think most of you, after you finish your sophomore year in, uh, in a science or engineering course, would know that that's a bogus idea. But it just amazes me to see what some people can get away with, at least for a while. Uh, so let's see, anything else on adhesives? So adhesives, typically the adhesives, we make things like fiberglass. Fiberglass is an adhesive. It's basically glass fibers plus uh, an adhesive. And you've got a lot of surface area because of the fibers. So we have asphalt with all the aggregate in there, or concrete with all the aggregate. We have fiberglass. We have any type of fibrous composite is basically just an adhesive, some sort of polymer adhesive with these fibers. Uh, sheets, aircraft, thin sections, it's not too hard. You, sheets, you got lots of surface area, and the sheet's not too thick, and you can get enough uh, strength across the whole thing. And one of the advantages of adhesives is because the adhesive usually has a lower modulus than the metal that if you're bonding a metal or a high strength fiber, it tends to distribute the stresses. The adhe adhesive is somewhat pliable, and you so you don't get big stress concentrations. It turns out adhesively bonded aircraft structures have better fatigue life than the uh, uh, structures that are riveted together. I mean, what's, you can't think of anything much worse in terms of fatigue than a riveted structure where you drill a hole, which is a crack starter, and then throw a rivet in there, and now you hide the crack as it starts. And there's plenty of failures over the years of aircraft failing at uh, rivet holes. Uh, anybody ever seen the picture of the Aloha Airlines aircraft? Okay, that Aloha Airlines where the whole top section came off, basically it was fatigue cracks running between the rivet holes. Uh, and the problem um, is that in Hawaii, there's a bunch of these half-hour flights between islands. And so that aircraft, that 737, had more takeoffs and landings per hour than any other 737 in the world it, it, by about a factor of two or three <laughs> because they're all short hops between the islands. Um, and every time you do that, you get a fatigue cycle because you've got to pressurize the cabin. I mean, the, the cabin itself is just a big pressure vessel. And typical cabins uh, will take you up to about 8,000 feet, and they, which is about, I can't remember, seven or eight psi below uh, atmospheric. I don't know, maybe it's only four psi. Anyway, you don't get a full 15 psi pre pressure differential between the, the inside of the fuselage and the outside, even if you go to 30,000 feet. And they take you up to about maybe an eight or 9,000 foot level. And if you've ever been skiing in the, in the Rocky Mountains, that's not a big deal. I mean. I get a little bit of altitude sickness at 10 or 11,000 feet, but not at 8 or 9,000 feet too much, um, so far as that goes. Anybody else ever had altitude thick sickness? Yep, you've had it? So so what's it like for you? Yeah, it's a big headache. When, when you first fly in, it's not a big problem. In fact, I'd been there a number of times for one or two days. It was when I was first there for three or four days. It was on the second or third days. And I started feeling really lethargic. And uh, uh, finally, I, I realized other times I hadn't felt all that great after 24 hours. But your blood chemistry takes three or four days to acclimatize to the uh, difference in oxygen level for some people. Uh, and for me, I, I remember, who is it? Uh, 
Robert Redford or somebody has this this uh, playhouse. It was one summer, and we were we were going up there, and it was like 10,000 feet, and you had to walk another 800 feet up into the uh, to the uh, open air theater where they had this play. And my children were running up ahead of me, and my wife was, a, and I was I was really getting tired. And when we got finally got up there, I just I didn't watch the play. I just kind of lay down and you know rested, and I was just it was like I'd just run a few miles. In my condition, that's really bad. Um, but in any case, um, but I can feel it when I get to ten or eleven thousand feet. I start feeling uh, feeling it. Any questions on adhesive bonding or other subjects? Cold welding. If not, we're going to start diffusion welding. By the way, the schedule this week is I'll be here every day, but Wednesday, Wednesday you'll see lecture number nine of three three seven one, and next week I'll be here every day at one. So um, we still plan to finish by Halloween. Um, diffusion welding and bonding, new subject. Um, basically, well, actually, I do have some diffusion welded joints. Um, basically, it's the same thing as cold welding, except I add heat to the process. Um, in fact, you know, start out with pressure welding where you're just squeezing things together and you've got to get rid of the contamination, you've got to get rid of the asperities. And we use heat in this case to also assist with the pressure, allows us to reduce the pressure. If I cold weld something together, I might have to use 20, 30, 40,000 psi to, in order to defer, deform things at room temperature. This is a piece of, it's getting five or ten years old now, but this was part of the F the development project for the F-22 fighter engine. This was a titanium, uh, it was going to be a titanium airfoil. This is just a slice of it, and they're developing it. And you take two pieces of titanium, lay them together, and you actually weld by uh, probably a resistant seam weld on the sides, and then put it in a fixture that clamps everything together, put it in a furnace, and the seam is the line, the mirror image line, the plane right in the middle of that thing. And you put it in a furnace, diffuse everything together, and you end up with a near perfect weld. Um, one of the advantages of diffusion welding or diffusion bonding is you can get a joint which is virtually indistinguishable from the surrounding material, base material. And that's not true of soldering, brazing, or most fusion welding processes. However, you pay a price for doing that. So you can get a near perfect weld, but it costs a fair amount of money. And therefore, it tends to be limited to expensive components like aircraft components. So we're adding heat to pressure welding, and the heat aids in deforming the asperities. Remember, we got these little mountain peaks that we got to get bit over. And we did that in cold welding in general by doing interfacial sliding, shear across the interface. Here, with heat, we actually can cause those mountain peaks to deform, and we can get 100% bonded area, whereas before, remember, with cold welding, we really couldn't get about more than about one-third bonded area. We also are going to use the heat to diffuse away surface contamination. And titanium, that piece that I'm passing around, is a beautiful material to diffusion weld because it dissolves, it's, it dissolves its own oxide. It dissolves nitrogen, oxygen, carbon, all kinds of contaminants. Titanium and iron are two materials that tend to diffuse away a lot of these surface impurity materials. They basically, as metals, are almost universal solvents. They just love to dissolve other junk. Um, and because of that, they diffusion weld very well. Now, other things that don't diffusion weld very well are things like aluminum. Aluminum melts at 660 centigrade. Its oxide melts at 2,000 degrees centigrade. If I were to try to make a joint like that, that foil there out of aluminum and press it together, I got this insulating, two insulating aluminum oxide layers that, and the problem with aluminum, it does not dissolve its own oxide. There's almost no solubility for oxygen in aluminum. And therefore, you can heat it all day and it won't diffuse away that surface contamination. Whereas titanium, particularly above 900 degrees centigrade, that oxide runs into that titanium. And so it, it cleans away the contamination by just diffusing it into the bulk. Um, now, we often, if I do need to weld diffusion bond aluminum, I'm going to have to use some sort of inner layer. And uh, 
Uh, I might use interlayers and other, and other things as well to avoid intermetallics, to match thermal expansion stresses, or to uh, achieve a compatible joining temperature. Uh, let me go through each one of those briefly. Um, avoiding intermetallics, the uh, mini materials, like if I wanted to bond aluminum to iron, you could say, well, iron would, would if I do the right things, uh, I might be able to get the, uh, the uh, oxide of aluminum to diffuse into the iron and end up with a aluminum iron joint. However, we use explosive bonding, a cold bonding, to make those uh, aluminum iron joints. And the reason is iron aluminum form intermetallics. Uh, that system forms intermetallics. Yes, you can diffuse things together, and you will end up with these intermetallics in a nice brittle interface. You hit it with a hammer, it'll shatter. So not very good. Now, if I wanted to make an aluminum to iron diffusion bonded joint, I could put nickel in between. Now, nickel doesn't diffuse into the aluminum, but it turns out the aluminum nickel oxide will help to diffuse away the oxygen, and iron and nickel don't form bad intermetallics. So I could plate the, the iron with, uh, with nickel, and I'll get, end up with a good joint. And that bearing that I passed around, I told you, they plate it with nickel to make a better surface. One of the reasons is they avoid the intermetallic. If, if the bearing were to heat up, you could form a brittle intermetallic, and the aluminum might flake off uh, because of the failure of the bond at the intermetallic. Um, another problem is I might use an inner layer which has an intermediate level of coefficient of thermal expansion to keep things from bowing like these bimetallic strips that I just talked about a little while ago. The, uh, um, we talked about the fiberware pot. And the fiberware pot, we actually don't get 100% bonded area. We actually leave some little regions of unbonded region between you know, kind of a checkerboard pattern of bonded and unbonded area. And that allows a little bit of compliance at the interface because aluminum and steel expand at very different rates. And that pot is definitely going to see heat as you put it on the stovetop. And the last thing you want is the aluminum to expand more rapidly than the stainless steel and cause the whole thing to turn into a spherical shaped bottom. And then the tip pots, the pot rocks on the surface, someone spills it all over them and you've got a lawsuit on your hand. Um, so the, uh, you've got to match the coefficient of thermal expansion. Uh, if you look at and you've got this in your notes. There's a um, article by Nicholas and Crispin on diffusion bonding stainless steel to alumina. Alumina is aluminum oxide, and using aluminum interlayers. And basically, they got this. They got the stainless steel. They got aluminum oxide, and they got a layer, inner layer of aluminum. In this case, they would get some intermetallics, but they also used some sheets of things with different coefficients or the metal with different coefficients of expansion, titanium, platinum, iron, stainless steel, and copper. And it turns out the sample strength versus the coefficient of thermal expansion goes like this. As the coefficient of exp expansion of the metal gets closer and closer to that of the ceramic, in this case, the strength of the joint goes shooting up to, this is 50 megapascals, which is not a tremendous strength, um, 70 me uh, I think that's megapascals. Yeah, it's megapascals. It's not a tremendous strength, but nonetheless, there is definitely an effect of the coefficient of thermal expansion. Why? Because I'm setting up residual stresses at the interface with the big difference in coefficient of expansion of these things. I'm doing the bonding at a high temperature, but I'm going to cool it down, and I leave these locked-in residual stresses, and those add to the failure stress uh, when I'm doing this. Uh, and that's probably enough for today. Tomorrow we'll finish up some on diffusion.